Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, online students. Thank you for joining class. Uh, welcome to our in-person students. Good to see all of you. And also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Um, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Father God, <clears throat> Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you and we bless you for this new day, Lord. Father, we thank you that you have given us an opportunity to learn your word. And we are so thankful to you, Lord. Father, we pray that we submit each one of us unto your loving hands, Lord. Lord, you give us wisdom and understanding and revelation from you, Lord, to live our lives according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So yesterday we were looking at Romans, studying Romans chapter 6 verses, um, uh, you know, till verse 8. We came right up to verse 8 where we were talking about um, our spiritual identification with Christ, how we identify with his uh, crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, and him seated with, the, uh, with um, you know, or us seated with Jesus, okay? So... We talked about crucifixion. How do we spiritually identify with it? The end of the old man and the breaking of the power of sin. Uh, the burial, how we identify with Christ's burial. The end of the old life. The uh, old life has no more claim on us. Okay, And resurrection, how do we identify with that spiritually? We are given a brand new life. We are now living the eternal life here and now and how do we identify with his ascension we are no longer under the influence of the systems or of the evil and rebellion of this world and we are seated with jesus is uh, what do we mean by that or how do we identify with that we operate out of a place of authority and dominion on this earth okay now, we said in resurrection, you know, uh, it identifies that we have a brand new life. We are living the eternal life here and now. So uh, eternal life does not start in heaven. Okay, It starts when we are born again here, right now here when we are born again. Okay, uh, Because all that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, is applied to you as a result of you know, of you accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior comes into your life the moment, the instant that you receive him as your Lord and Savior, okay? So right now we are already living and walking in the eternal life, okay? And the life of God is in us. We know that some part of it is yet true to you know, be fulfilled, it will be fulfilled in uh, when we see Jesus face to face, you know, uh, yet our bodies now are mortal, we are going to die, we are going to the grave, you know, one fine day, but in our spirit, we have eternal life, uh, it's already there, you know, but it will only get better, okay, we will receive our glorified bodies, we will be with God in heaven, but the eternal life has already started inside, us. We are walking in the newness of life because, uh, you know, we are uh, resurrected with Jesus Christ. Okay. Now we'll move on to uh, verses 9 following. So can somebody please read verses 9 and 10, please? Verse 9. Knowing that Christ have been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer have dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives. Amen. So in verses 9 and 10, what Christ died for, he died once for all, right? He completed the work that no longer has dominion over him and it will always remain under him. Okay, And then in verses 11 to 14, Paul goes to list out five action points to live free from sin. Okay, So can someone please read verses 11 to 14? Likewise, you also reckon, uh, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Mortal that you should obey 
it in its lust and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourself to god as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to god for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace amen so was then he's pointing to jesus he's saying uh, you know look at jesus he died to sin once for all and he lives he is alive and he lives to god okay and then he begins verse 4 say, uh, saying likewise so there is a connection he starts verse 11 by saying you know likewise so they're saying there is a connection so what he said in verse 10 and what he's going to tell us now there is a connection so likewise in the same manner that jesus died once and he's alive to god fully consecrated and dedicated to the father hence we too need to live in the same way okay and then paul goes on to present five action points that we must take to live free from sin or he says the truth of identification our spiritual identification is to be lived out like this how is it to be lived out verse 11 he says reckon your selves verse 12 he says do not let sin reign verse 13 do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness verse 13 also he says present yourselves to god and the latter part of verse 13 says present your members as instruments of righteousness okay now when we look at all of these action points it may seem that taking these five action points is very difficult but paul will explain to us later in chapter 8 that we can do this with the help of the holy spirit so we cannot achieve all of this in our own efforts you know we can only be able to live this out by the power or the uh, uh, or the empowering of the holy spirit okay so in verse uh, romans chapter 8 verse 13 it says for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live and galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says it's in your notes I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay. So here the first thing, action point that he's telling us is reckon yourself. Verse 11, he says, likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the Greek word for reckon, you know, Paul uses here is a word, you know, we've also seen in chapter four okay and you know it's translated as accounted imputed or counted okay so it simply means to put into one's account okay when something has put into your account it's there so it can you you can take it it's yours okay or so be it it's yours okay and it's a fact okay you can count it as a fact that it is yours so reckon yourself means consider your selves okay so in the greek the word is accounting so i'll just give you an example say a man has 10 notes worth 10 rupees each or each of these 10 notes are worth 10 rupees however however he counts it it will amount to how much 100 rupees right however he counts it it will amount to 100 it cannot be disputed it cannot in any way be questioned that these 10 notes of 10 rupees is not amounting or equal to 100 cannot be disputed cannot be in any way questioned so in the same way he says reckon your self that means count it as a fact consider yourself dead to sin so what should you consider as a fact consider your this fact or reckon uh, to this that you are dead to sin and alive to god okay so like christ he died once for all for sin and the life that he lives he lives to god in the same way we need to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to god so every believer must say hey i am dead to sin once for all and i'm alive to god okay so 
you know, once you embrace this, you accept this, you reckon it, you consider it, you know, you take it as a fact that you're dead to sin, that you're alive to God, it means that sin has nothing to do with you or you don't have anything to do with sin. And everything that you have, you have to do with God, okay? Because we are alive to God, we are open to God, we are in a relationship with God, we're in a connection uh, with God, and we now live and move and have our being in Him. Amen? So we embrace this truth, we accept it as a fact, we announce it, we declare that we are dead to sin, and um, when we are dead to sin, it means that we have nothing to do with sin, okay? The second action point, he says, is do not let sin reign, okay? Verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. So when I'm done with sin because I'm dead to sin and alive to God, therefore, Paul is saying, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. That means what? I refuse to give in to sin or refuse to give any place for sin in my body. Why? I am dead to sin and I'm alive to God and sin has no place in my life. Hence, a believer becomes intolerant to sin. Now, God has set our free, uh, uh, free will power from the power of sin. When he crucified the old man, uh, the, uh, the body of sin was destroyed. Our spirit is born again, is, uh, and our spirit man is free from the power of sin, for the dominion and slavery to sin. But still, sin seeks to reign in our mortal bodies, okay? And it wants us to obey its lust. However, we can make a choice to prevent sin from ruling in our mortal bodies. We can prevent giving in to the desires of our natural bodies, okay? So we can prevent sin from ruling over the desires of our natural bodies. And we, how do we do that? We need to consider ourselves dead to sin. Hey, I'm dead to sin, I cannot be doing this. I'm alive to God, I have the nature of God. And, you know, you uh, ask the Holy Spirit to help you in that area. So we have to make this bold declaration. It's there in your notes. Sin has no place in me. Sin will rule over, uh, will not rule over my natural appetites, desires, and affections. Sin will not reign over my mortal body. So I think some of these declarations we need to boldly declare and decree over our lives. Okay. The third thing, action point that Paul mentions is do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, verse 13, okay? Um, so he's saying as an act of your will, as a willing choice that you are making, you are saying that, hey, my body is not going to be a weapon of sin or unrighteousness. The word instrument here means weapon, okay? And the word present means to yield, to bring before, uh, to assist, to give, or to aid. And the word instruments also means weapons or tools or utensils. So Paul tells us to refuse to yield our bodily parts as weapons or tools or utensils or instruments of unrighteousness. And we must learn to say no, okay? So, for example, you refuse to yield your eyes to looking at anything that is lustful, anything that is sexually gratifying, images or videos, or looking lustfully at the opposite sex, or you refuse to do, you know, use our eyes to as tools for anything that is unrighteous that results in sin. Okay. Similarly, we refuse also the other members or the other parts of our body to be instruments or tools or weapons of unrighteousness okay the fourth action point is he says present yourselves to god so can somebody read romans 6 13 please and 6 13 and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourself to god as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to god amen 
So since by the act of our will, we are making a choice that our body is not going to be a weapon of sin or unrighteousness, we can say, God, I present myself 100% to you and my body as a weapon of righteousness, which means my body is, you know, going to advance righteousness or it means that my body is going to, you know, um, uh, fulfill or do what is right, what is righteous in God's eyes. Okay. All of you able to understand? Yes? No? Okay. The fifth one, present your members as instruments of um, righteousness. Fourth one was present yourselves to God. Fifth one is present your members as instruments of righteousness. So can somebody, okay, we've already read that, right? And it says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So we're saying that, hey God, you know, we're saying we yield every member of our body to God so that every member serves as instruments or as weapons of righteousness. Okay. And verse 14, uh, look at what verse 14 says. Can somebody read that, please? He gives us a reason why we can do the above five actions that he has asked us to do. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So it says, you know, the reason we can do the above five action points is because sin will not have any mastery or dominion over us. Why? Because God has set us free from the power of sin, the control of sin. Now we can make a choice of what we wish to do with the members of our bodies and how we wish to present our and what we wish to present ourselves to, whether we wish to present ourselves as members of our bodies to right unrighteousness or to righteousness or uh, to uh, sin or to God. So Paul is saying in, in verse 14, for sin shall have no dominion over you, which means sin has no right, sin has no dominion over the believers. And then he says, we are not under the law, but under grace. And then he's drawing a contrast between the law and being under the law and being under the grace. Now, what is the contrast? The law, it told us what is the right thing to do, right? The law tells us, hey, this is sin. This is what you can do. This is what you cannot do, okay? But the law did not empower us how to keep the law, right? But grace told us what is the right thing to do and also empowered us to do the right thing. So the law was there, is telling people what is the right thing to do, but did not empower them. But grace not only says the right thing to do, but also empowers us to do the right thing. Now the standard under grace is much greater than the standard under the law. The law says do not murder, but, the, uh, but grace says that if you hate somebody, it's equal to murder. The law says do not commit adultery, but grace says if you look lustfully at somebody, you have already committed adultery in your heart. So hence we see the standards under grace is much greater than the standards of the law. And then Paul, you know, expands about law and grace more in chapter uh, 7. But, you know, how do we apply these truths or, you know, applying this truth, how do we apply these truths that we have learned? It's by affirming these truths, okay? So one of the best ways to apply these truths is to affirm it, to declare the truth of God's word over our lives. Now, we have just learned, you know, till chapter 6 and we've learned so much, uh, so many truths. What we need to do is we need to declare that over our lives. When we affirm truth, we bring our whole being under the subjection of the truth that we are affirming to. Okay? And when we declare truth, we are stretching the sword of the spirit against the powers of darkness and against every evil work and bondages are 
broken. Unclean spirits withdraw their influence and deliverance takes place. So that's what happens when we declare the truth. Okay, we can see that demonic powers are broken and uh, we, we experience deliverance. So what do we boldly declare? There is um, a declaration there. Can somebody read that, please? In Jesus' name, I declare what the word of God states about me. I am in Christ and have been identified with his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and sitting at the right hand of the Father. The old man has been crucified and the power of sin over my life has been destroyed. I count myself as someone who is completely dead to sin. I am alive to God. Sin has no place in me. Sin will not rule over my life natural appetites, desires, and affections. Sin will not reign over my natural body, Mo sorry, mortal body. I consecrate every part of me to God. My eyes, ears, tongues, hands, and feet. Every part of me is consecrated to God. I consecrate my appetites, desires, affections, and my will to God. I yield my entire being to God and all my members as instruments of righteousness. Amen. So, you know, when you're paying a daily, you can add this as, you know, uh, some lines that you can pray uh, for yourselves as well. Okay. So we need to, how do we apply these truths that we're learning? By affirming them, by declaring them, that speaking over them in our lives. Okay. Now we'll move on uh, versus, anyone has any questions so far? Verse 15. No? Okay, let's move on. Um, uh, can somebody read verses 15 to verse 18, please? 15 to 16 to 18. What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are the ones slaves whom you obey, whether of sins leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that you, that though you were slaves of sins, yet you obeyed from the heart that forms of doctrine to which you were delivered and having been set free from sin you become slaves of righteousness amen thank you so in verse 15 he asked the second main question remember we said there are two main questions verse 1 and verse 15 so what is the second main question shall we sin we're not under the law, but under grace. Okay. And to answer this, he's asking two more questions, which is in verses 16 and verse 21. Now, you know, um, Paul's style is to, we've seen Paul's style in, you know, in his writing to the church at Rome. Uh, he's asking a question, which is called a rhetorical question, which he answers, or the answer is very implicit. It's right there. Okay, so that was the meaning of a rhetorical question. Some, somebody asks a question, answers it, or the answer is very implicit. It's right there. So he says, what then shall we sin? Because we're not under law, but under grace. And what does he say? Certainly not. Why? He says, because I already told you to present yourselves to God. Right? So when you're presenting yourselves, you are submitting yourselves. You're becoming a slave of what you are submitting to. So under the law, you are a slave to sin, but under grace, you are a slave of righteousness. So under the law, you were a slave to sin because the law made it very evident that we couldn't keep the law and we had no power to overcome sin. And so we ended up as slaves of sin, right? But under grace, we are slaves of God and slaves of righteousness. 
Why are we slaves? Because we are willingly presenting ourselves to God, right? That is why he says we are slaves. We are willingly presenting ourselves to God when we are born again. Or when we were slaves of sin before we were born again, we were willingly giving ourselves over to uh, sin. Verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Now the Greek, Greek word, sorry, <laughs> Greek, the Greek word for slave is doulos. And doulos means bond servant. It also means bond servant. Remember where else Paul used this word bond servant? Yeah, in the beginning, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. His same way, word Paul refers to himself in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, where he said he was a bond servant of Christ. So what is the meaning of bond servant? Why does Paul say he's a bond servant of Christ? Because he voluntarily or willingly chooses to be a slave, to be completely surrendered, uh, submitted, obedient to his master for life. And he's willing to do whatever his master wants him to do. That is the meaning of bond servant. So under the law, you're a slave to sin, uncleanliness, and lawlessness. Under grace, you're a slave of God and righteousness. So in both cases, we are slaves, right? But only the difference is what? Who the master is, right? Yeah. Under the law, we are slaves to sin. Under grace, we are slaves to God and to righteousness. Okay. Now, remember what he said in verse 13. He said, present yourselves to God. So having presented ourselves to God, we now have become slaves of God. And slaves of God means what? We are now slaves of God means we are here to obey God. We are slaves of doing what is right or slaves of righteousness. We are born servants of righteousness. So we have an option to live righteous lives because we have presented ourselves to God. Okay. And or you have an option to go back to your old sinful ways and live according to the old carnal nature. Okay. And verse 13, he said, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, while he says, uh, uh, you know, while he says this, he gives thanks to uh, God. Okay. Verse 17. Look at what he says in verse uh, 17. Can somebody read verse 17, please? 17 and 18. But God be thank, thank to that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that from of doctrine to which you were delivered and having been set free from sin, you because became slaves of righteousness. Amen. So here he's making a contrast. What is he making a contrast of? Slave of sin and slaves of righteousness. So he says, you were slaves of sin and having been set free from sin, now you became slave of righteousness. So how are we no longer slaves of sin and now slaves of righteousness? What is What made the difference? So he says, what made that difference? How are you no longer of sin now? You know, and you are now slaves of righteousness. What made that difference? So he's saying the difference it made is that you obeyed from the heart. You obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine or the teaching that was delivered to you. So they were given, they were given teaching, they were taught the gospels, they were the gospel was shared with them. Okay. And also we are going through the same teachings now. And this teaching took them from being slaves of sin to being set free and becoming slaves of righteousness. He says, how did it happen? Because you obeyed from the 
heart. That means they wholeheartedly obeyed and they wholeheartedly gave themselves to this teaching. So here he says, here, um, a form of doctrine. What does form mean? Now in the Greek, it basically means a mold or a cast. Okay. Now in factories, when they want to make something, they make a mold and what do they do? They pour the liquid, they pour the plastic or copper or gold or silver, whatever is into the mold. And whatever liquid is poured into that mold, it takes the form or the shape of that mold. Okay. So he's saying this teaching or doctrine that was brought to you is like a mold. And when you have an obedient heart, it is like that liquid that has been poured into this mold, okay, which is that mold is that teaching or that doctrine. And when it becomes solid, right, when that liquid that is poured into the mold, when it becomes, you know, solidifies, it comes out as something different. Yes or no? Yeah, from a liquid form to a, 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 a it has a form and a shape, something that the exactly like the mold okay so he's saying they are slaves of sin but they have been set free from sin why because he says they wholeheartedly accepted the teaching the teaching was the mold the cast um, uh, the teaching was that mold and it was that cast uh, that you know helped them to set them free from being slaves of sin and becoming slaves of righteousness so that is why he's saying the truth needs to be communicated to the church believers. He says, when the church believers, when they receive this truth, you know, wholeheartedly, what will happen? The word of God will produce the same results like it produced back then. Like all of these people who accepted the Lord Jesus because they heard the gospel, you know, and they believed with their whole heart, they accepted it. So he says, in the same way, you know, we need to also preach and teach this so that people can receive this truth wholeheartedly so that the word of God will produce the same results in these people's life as it did back then, okay? Now, Paul is summing up what he's saying, but while he's summing up, he's recognizing a problem that believers can still have which he deals with in verses 19 to 23. And what is the, he's saying, hey, we are dead to sin. Sin has no power. Sin has no authority. Sin has no dominion. You are not slaves of sin. You are slaves of righteousness. And all of you might be saying, hey, all that is true. Okay. But what do I do with the weakness in my flesh? You know, my flesh is craving to indulge in sin or give in to sin. What do I do with that. So even as Paul sums up, he's recognizing, hey, there is a problem. Even though all of these truths and facts are reckoned, are accounted for, is counted, is put into our account, but yet there is something that we need to deal with. And what is that? The weakness of our flesh, which is what he's speaking in verses 19 to 23. So can somebody please read verses 19? Romans chapter 6 was from 19 to 23. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. And for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the, in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death, but now have been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
So Paul is summing up things here and he's saying, even as he's summing it up, he's saying there is a problem. You know, he recognizes a problem that believers can still have, which he's dealing with in verses 19 to 23. He's saying there's the weakness of our flesh. So he says in verse 19, I speak in human terms, which means Paul is using a language that they can understand okay he's referring to using the example of being a slave so it says as we apply this truth of identification to overcome sin which he has already discussed in length in chapters five and six he says we are going to walk in holiness okay and this is what paul is getting to but he's saying that there is a problem what is a problem even as we are dead to sin, we have the spiritual identification. We have overcome sin. Sin no longer reigns and rules us. We have dominion over it. But yet there is one problem, the weakness of our flesh. Now the word flesh has different meanings in the New Testament. Okay, It means the body. Okay, But it can also mean the sinful evil desires of the outer man, uh, uh, the body. And the flesh here also can mean natural evil desires of the body. Okay, So in Galatians 5, he writes about the works of the flesh. And he lists out various works of the flesh. Uh, and he says that's the evil desires of the body. But here he says that, that there is something that he, here he's saying there is the weakness in our flesh. And he will go on to elaborate it or talk about more about this in chapter 7. Okay? But how do we get rid of the weakness of our flesh where sin has a strong grip for a very, very long time? How do we get rid of this weakness of the flesh? Okay, So he says all this happens as an act of our will. Again, he's repeating the idea of willfully presenting or yielding our bodies or ourselves as slaves. He's already said this in verse 16. He says, now present yourself as slaves to obey. And verse 19, he says, now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Something that he's already talked about in the preceding verses, he's again mentioning it. So he's saying, how can you overcome the weakness of the flesh? It's something that you have to make a choice, okay? And it's an act of our will. And he repeats the same idea and he's saying, you know, you have to present or yield yourselves as slaves to obey, and verse 16, and as slaves of righteousness for holiness, okay? Now, before we were born again, you know, we continually presented our members as slaves of impurity, uncleanliness, to lawlessness, which is, you know, a violation of the law, wickedness, transgression. And it always led to more breaking of the sins, breaking of the law, more of transgressions, violating the law. But he says, now, since we are in Christ, he says, now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Okay. So Paul is reminding us, the church at Rome, and also reminding us that that they were in sin, but you know the end of those things was death, right? Uh, that is what he's saying. The end of those things is death. Was twenty one for the end of those things is uh, death. He said, and he says the wages of sin is always death. Was twenty three, but however, when we yield ourselves as slaves to God as slaves of righteousness, what do we bear? We bear the fruit of holiness, verses 19 and 22. And what does this lead to? Eternal life. Okay. So yes, God's grace has been made uh, freely available for us to free us from sin. And in response to God's grace, what must we do? We must willingly make ourselves as slaves of God and slaves of Un, of, of righteousness and what is the result it will end uh, end up in us living holy lives before god right so he's saying even as all of these things are there 
yes, we are born again in our spirit, man. We have the same old mind, the same old, uh, you know, bodies. But what should we do? We need to make a conscious effort, choice and a will to become slaves, to obey God and slaves of righteousness and holiness. Okay. So uh, in chapter seven, you know, the whole discussion about the weakness of the flesh, where he talks about the struggle of man who has the law of God. He wants to obey God, but he doesn't have the power to do it like all of us, right? We have the law of God. We have the word of God. We want to obey God, but we don't have the power to do it. Why? Because of the weakness of the flesh. Our flesh sometimes cries out louder. You know, Paul all, Paul writes in, 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 in Galatians chapter 5, there is a war that is happening, right? The spirit and the flesh. The flesh is craving for something. The spirit is claiming for craving for something else, okay? So he explains why the flesh is weakened in chapter 7. And chapter 8, he says, for those who are born again believers, this is the answer. What is the answer? The work of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, we know there is weakness in the flesh, but there is a law, the law of the spirit of life. And the spirit of life, okay, the Holy Spirit helps us to conquer the flesh. So we will see in Romans 8 how we as believers can live that victorious life. That is what he goes on to talk about in chapter 8, okay? Any questions? Before we move on to chapter 7. No questions? Oh, you're not able to hear. Nina John, you're able to hear now? Sorry, I didn't see the chat. Yes, now is okay. I think something I had to adjust, but I couldn't hear for the last. I mean, it was very hardly I could hear. It's okay, no problem. The others were able to hear me clearly the whole lecture. What about the others? Can you please respond? Oh, Shiv Kumar, okay, thank you. What about Chaya Paul? Okay, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, I thought you were unable to hear because we had actually, there was a little silence. We were waiting for Prince to, you know, get the, the words to read. So then I thought maybe that's why you're not able to hear that time. Yeah. Okay, any questions anyone has for chapter 6? Can you please increase that fan volume? Chapter 6, anyone has any? Uh, just sweating like anything. Any questions? No? Okay, we just have uh, two more minutes. Um, we'll stop here. Okay. We'll begin Chapter 7 uh, next week. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. If there's no questions, we'll end class. Thank you. Um, have a blessed day. God bless. Thank you.